Dan Proft coming to you live from the Skyline Club for another edition of Against the Current. We're pleased to be joined on this edition by Dean Angelo Sr. He's the president of the Fraternal Order of Police Lodge 7 in Chicago. Dean, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. You're welcome. So uh, poll out this week, Kaiser Foundation, New mm -hmm. York Times poll yeah. that finds Rahm Emanuel with a 62% disapproval rate, 70% disapproval rate among African-American residents of Chicago. Mm -hmm. Why do you think his disapproval rate is so high? Well, I believe a lot of it has to do with what happened with the video, with the Laquan McDonald incident, and um, what's happened subsequent to that with the amount of crime, the increase in crime, um, the uh, mistrust of the police department that was written in uh, the task force report didn't help. Um, although we totally disagree with the findings of that report, I don't think it helped the overall situation. Do you think that part of that is uh, Rahm Emanuel and his administration and a qu very quiet, very church mouse-like city council uh, essentially fomenting mistrust of police, that we have this conversation going on now that police is where we should focus our attention rather than gangbangers, misconduct within the Chicago Police Department as opposed to uh, violent street gangs? Well, you know, there was a target put on the FOP soon after the release of the video. It was said that the video could not be released because of the FOP contract. My response to that would be, what changed in our contract from November of 2014 to November of 2015 to allow that video to be released. So Rom nothing could, changed. Rom could have released the video if he wanted to. There's nothing changed in our contract to sort of point the finger at the FOP. Um, you know, the downtown, the city council, um, the department heads um, all pointed their uh, an accusatory finger and put us in the crosshairs and I think that was unfair. And I believe that also led to the, um, I testified at the city council uh, shortly thereafter, and we were riddled with, you know, this contract, the FOP, you're the problem, why? What did we do? Um, this didn't start with us, but there were fingers pointed in our direction, and now we've become the target. And so that report that you're referencing that uh, came out uh, early spring, uh, that essentially the conclusion was, or one of the overriding conclusions, this is Lori Lightfoot was essentially the spokesman for this task force mm -hmm. that the mayor assembled, essentially was the problem in the Chicago Police Department is systemic racism. Uh, that uh, task force went so far in the report as to essentially say Chicago police officers, 48% of whom are minorities, black or Latino, mm -hmm. <clears throat> have a disregard for the lives of minority residents of Chicago. Your reaction to that? It's ridiculous. To, to say that the officers that go into these communities don't care for the communities they work in each and every day is a complete disconnect. What we would like to do is invite all of these people that buy into that to ride along with those officers, get in a squad car with them. We've asked city council people to do it, and they don't. We've asked people in Springfield to do it, and they won't. We don't know Too why. Dangerous. Well, I don't know. Maybe they lose their narrative if they go in there and they see what happens and they see the way that the officers are faced with a, a level of disrespect that's never been seen before in my 36 years. And, and I think it's important that they get a feel for it. When I testified at the uh, Senate subcommittee about body cameras coming, um, I, I was looked at with uh, confusion by some of the people on the Senate subcommittee because I told them, you're going to be subjected to a segment of our society that you have no idea exists. And, and you need to be exposed to this. I don't want to see any editing in these videos that come out with the body cameras. I think it's important that the, our entire population see what police officers are confronted with each and every day. And I told them then and this is a, over a year ago, that you're going to come away with a brand new uh, level of respect for what these women and men do each and every day in the city of Chicago. We've got a great police department. We've got some very dedicated, professional people wearing this uniform. But they get <clears throat> shortchanged with comments like systemic racism because they don't see what these police officers are exposed to every day. And it's important that they do. So you taught, so, you know, rough numbers, 6,000. <clears throat> 
black and Latino police officers on the Chicago Police Department. You can interact with them on a daily basis the way that few people do. Mm -hmm. When that report came out with those charges, and then again, as we're discussing, the way that Chicago police have been targeted as the enemy in certain circles, not everywhere, but in certain mm -hmm. circles, what's the reaction from those black and Latino officers to those conclusions, this kind of rhetoric? Well, we have African-American officers that work in Inglewood, and they want to know if they're racist, too, because that's 99% of their stops are with Af African-Americans. And, and that's part of the problem that I have with that statement and, and Ms. Lifewood's report. They never remove that, um, that variable. They never remove the Hispanic guys or girls that are working in Pilsen or in Humble Park. They never remove the African-American officers that are working in Roseland and in Inglewood. And, and if you don't take that into consideration, your numbers are skewed. And that's where I got the bias statements that I came away with with that report. If you don't consider the entire population of your study and then remove the population that doesn't play to that result, you're unfairly targeting um, the entire department as being racist and you're not taking out the or not even considering the variables about ethnic officers stopping ethnic populations. Or are they racist too? And, and I just don't see that. And this is also isn't to say that every white officer that stops a black or Latino person or every black or Latino officer that stops a white person, sometimes it has nothing to do with race, I presume. It has to do with somebody's conduct. Is that, is that a possibility? Or where you're assigned. Right. right. Well, right, but somebody's conduct within the district you're assigned. Right. You're not just randomly stopping people because they're a different race than you. No. I presume that's not no, happening you, on a routine you stop basis. People that's based not police protocol. Right, right, right. We don't seek out people that don't look like us and pull them over. What we do is we look for behaviors. We look for criminal behaviors. We get calls, 911 calls that send you there. Plus, if you're assigned to, if you're a Caucasian girl or guy and you're assigned to Inglewood, 99% of the population in Inglewood is African American. So when you're conducting your daily business and your routine traffic stops or, or you're looking for, um, um, a group based on a call for service, there's a bunch of gangbangers on the corner and they're selling narcotics or they're in possession of a handgun. You don't get to pick and choose what corner that, that call is, is, is taking you to. You stop the people on that corner and, and those are kids of color. Well, and a Chicago police lieutenant, a friend of mine, made an interesting comment when we were talking about this. He said, <clears throat> so if I'm working in Inglewood and I see a white kid or a white guy there um, that's unusual because of what you just said, the demographics of the neighborhood. So probably they're from the suburbs to buy drugs exactly. or they're from some other neighborhood to buy drugs. Right. Now, if I target him for being in Inglewood to buy drugs, am I, as a white guy or a black guy, racially profiling the white guy who's in Inglewood to buy drugs? I mean, this is how crazy it gets when you it seems to me just narrowly focus on the race of the suspect uh, or subject and the race of the police officer rather than the contextual information of who's doing what. Mm -hmm. It's criminal profiling. And when I was in the gang crime unit, I used to work the west side a lot. And when we saw a kid drive up around Washington and Pine, which is predominantly African American, and he's got a suburban city sticker, and he's in mommy's BMW, well, we pull him down and we know exactly what he's there for. He's not lost. You know, he's not looking for his high school classmate. You know, he's buying dope. And, and we would do that regularly because it's criminal profiling. You look for behaviors that fit the pattern. And that example fits the pattern. How impactful do you think it will be uh, the decision by Mayor Emanuel to remove Gary McCarthy as police chief, bringing in Eddie Johnson, an African-American, as police chief? Is that, uh, is that something that's more of a PR move or is that something that's going to materially change the police culture and uh, start to maybe rebuild some of the trust that has been watered down per this report? Well, you know, <clears throat> Superintendent Johnson's coming with a lot of positive uh, feedback from our members. And for a, a boss to go that high up the ranks and not have some, somebody call up and say, oh, my God, how could they possibly pick this guy? Um, we haven't heard that yet. And it's been a while. We would have heard by now. So a lot of the press from our membership that's coming forward about Superintendent Johnson is pretty positive. So he, he more or less is um, being portrayed as a, as a policeman's policeman, as a guy that came from 
with our own ranks, which is a positive for them based on the last two, you know, Gary McCarthy and Jody Weiss. So guys were happy that that happened. We had a 66% chance we were going to get somebody from out of town. Right, in terms um, of the finalists. Right, and, um, and people were a little concerned about that, our rank and file. So um, I think it is, right now, it's early, but right now, departmental-wise, he's got some pretty good um, reports coming from the from the from the rank and file. Um, how he resonates that to the to the communities and the churches and the politicians, you know, that's a that's a different because story. there's a political component, of oh course, God, to being the hugely, Chicago police chief. Yeah, it's all, it's all political. Mm. This entire city's politics. I've heard that, yeah. yeah. Um, and so, uh, but let me ask you this now, because uh, we've talked on the show about this, and we talked about, uh, you know, in any organization, 13,000 people, no less, an organization as big as Chicago Police Department, mm -hmm. you're going to have people that are bad actors or that make a catastrophic error in judgment, that do bad things. And one of the things that you said when we were talking about this, just in terms of the adjudicative process to deal with a police officer who has done something wrong or maybe has repeatedly done something wrong. So, you know, I'm, you told me this, I'm <coughs> paraphrasing, but you essentially mm -hmm. said, um, I'm not going to tell you that no bad cop has ever been put back on the street because that's happened. Clearly, we know that's happened. So if that does happen, even if it's a relatively isolated incident in the context of an organization this big, what should be done? What is the philosophy of the FOP and rank and file police officers to deal with that officer that is a bad actor or that committed a bad act? Well, my job and any union's job is to keep your employees employed right. and, and your members employed. So when we get a case of misconduct brought to us by an officer, um, we look at the individual incident. We also look at their background. You cannot go from zero disciplinary history to separation in 99% of the cases. You need to have a foundation. You need to have said along that officer's career who's got a 95 efficiency, a 98 efficiency, and is one of your hard workers and has never been taken to task, and then you write him up and you try to remove him, give him 30 days pending separation on, a, on an incident, and you say, oh, and in the past, he or she's done this, this, and this. But where is it? Where's the history? Where's the foundation? Well, we never really wrote him up because he was a worker. Well, then that's on you. We don't perform that task for the department. If the department has a guy that's got a behavioral issue and discipline is supposed to adjust behaviors, if they have a disciplinary history and, and they attempt to give them an oral reprimand and then a written reprimand and then a day or three days and then they send them the behavioral alert or, or um, the... Um, uh, behavioral intervention program and they take them to classes and they sensitize them and they put them through the process and then they come back and continue that behavior that they were called on the carpet for, then you have an opportunity organizationally to either severely admonish and discipline them or remove them. But when you don't follow the process and you don't try to adjust that behavior with increasing discipline, that's on them. So when we get to an arbitrator and we have an officer that's looking at extensive time off, suspension-wise, the first thing they look at is their complementary and disciplinary history. And if there's nothing there, just send them back to work. Now, is there such a thing, though, or should there be, <clears throat> of zero tolerance for certain, uh, for, for certain behaviors? Uh, drug use on the job mm -hmm. comes to mind. Um, if you're convicted of a crime, particularly a violent crime, something like that where you are one and done. It doesn't need to be a history of bad choices. It could be one catastrophic bad choice and we can't tolerate you on the force. And that's in play right now. What, what's the stricture? Well, if, 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 you, if you do a drug test and you drop a sample, a urine sample, you're positive, you're gone. If you're arrested for a crime um, uh, and, and, and you're, even before conviction, they'll get rid of you. You know, in, in the circumstance with Officer Van Dyke, he was in a performance of his duty. So although the video is a silent movie that people see, oh my God, here's the incident, he's in a performance of his duty. 
and and the, whether the 16 shots are, are going to be argued in court, um, you know, that is subsequent to the incident, the initial incident. You know, we saw a video that came out shortly thereafter, um, and there was the audio attached to it when uh, Alvarez was putting it out. Um, and they showed the video along with the audio to substantiate the anxiety and the stress and the calls. Oh my God, he's got a gun, he's running this way. And the conversations are jumping all over each other and then the incident occurs. It justifies what happens on the scene of these types of incidents. We don't see that or we don't hear that with this video. We don't hear the radio calls. We hear in the proffer when they read for the bond, we heard that um, such and such car calls for a taser. Immediately, 823 responds or comes on the air, we're on our way. Giving you the impression that 823 has a taser and no one wants to wait for them to show up. 823 is on the scene of that incident. They don't have a taser. But they, they sort of subliminally let this uh, little bit of information out to give the impression that no one wants to wait for the taser. There are no tasers on the street that night. They're in the lock, they're, they're in, the, in, in the station. So I think that wasn't fair and slanted, the, the overall narrative of that event. And let's hear the audio. Let's hear that, that the officer involved, Officer Van Dyke, is on the scene and blocks the offender's path to get to Burger King because there's people in Burger King, he's still armed with a knife, and he just confronted two other people with a knife. So we don't hear that. We don't hear that he's still there or that he's never left the scene. He's part of this. So does that give any more credence to the incident? I don't know. But why are we hearing about one, why are we listening to one audio that they justify the incident? And we don't hear it in this one because nobody wants to justify it. I mean, I, and I understand, you know, I don't want to relitigate this mm -hmm. whole right. matter as it's still pending in a, in a criminal right. court. But you know, people look at that video uh, obviously, there's <clears throat> people are upset based mm -hmm. on everything that led up to its final release, like right. you were talking right. about, too. Uh, we make one decision for a year, then we make another decision under political pressure because we know the video is coming out per a judicial decree, and we want to cover our butts, basically, um, in addition to the whole kind of opaque nature of the settlement that was preemptively offered the Laquan McDonald family. But you look at that video. And you see a couple of things. One, you see other officers on the scene who didn't open fire. Mm -hmm. And two, of course, it's the, you know, and this is what we heard back from a lot of listeners, lay people like myself. Uh, I watch that. I say, okay, maybe I can you know, try and put myself in that officer's position and he's close enough. And did he make a feint toward the officer, didn't he? I could see him shooting once. But to shoot 16 times, mm -hmm. to continue shooting when Laquan McDonald is on the ground, the combination of other officers on the scene not opening fire and the 16 shots kind of shocks people's conscience. Mm -hmm. So what would you say in terms of telling them how they should try and understand that scene or per perhaps withhold judgment based on what a police officer is supposed to do in that circumstance? Well, <clears throat> without getting into the case, but you know, you asked a question, so I'll give you an answer, I'm not gonna lie. We have a situation where I believe tactfully there was an error in judgment the way they approached. When the vehicle pulls up that Usher Van Dyke is in, they're nose away from Laquan McDonald. That car should have been faced the opposite way. And not only that, it, it angles to the right. So the driver makes a should quick have right turn. Should face the opposite way. It should have been facing front. Yes. Yeah, so should have faced have Laquan McDonald to the front. When your door opens, you have cover. You use your door as cover. Um, not only does that not happen, but at the last second, the driver pulls a wheel to the right, which puts McDonald right almost in the path of, of where Officer Van Dyke is. So when he comes out, bam, it's right there, no cover. Um, tactfully, that was, I think, an issue. Um, the, the volleys of shots that, that occur, there's court precedent that once you engage, there's no limitation on the engagement. So I believe that'll be coming out as well. There's so many things that are going to come out in this trial um, that I think people are going to get a different perspective of the event. Once they hear the audio, 
or, or once they have experts come in and, and testify to things like this. I believe that there's going to be a lot of people that, are gonna, that, that don't have a, a preconceived notion of what should happen, that let the opportunities of the court play itself out. And they're going to sit back and they're going to go, I never thought of that. Or a light bulb might go off, or there might be some type of a uh, re-examination within themselves of what they see and, and what happened that night. Are you concerned at all of what will happen in a city that's racially polarized and, and suffers from de facto segregation? We talked about some of the neighborhoods mm -hmm. um, in the schools as well as in the neighborhoods. Right. I mean, one, they're two, the two are connected, of course. If uh, Laquan McDonald, I mean, excuse me, if Officer Van Dyke was acquitted for the murder of Laquan McDonald, what could happen in the city in terms of the public's response? I'm worried about the city every day, you know, and it would be accentuated, you know, if there's a not guilty verdict. There is a, um, a tension on our streets right now that our officers see every day when they're out there. There are, there are communities, you mentioned the communities in, in our city. There are neighborhoods in our city where the fourth generation is walking through the same empty lot that was burned out in the 60s. And no one has, has, has put a foundation. No one's thought about building there. My God, how can you not look at that and say, we've got a problem. It's not our job to, to build that building or that senior center. But, but there are kids whose grandfathers walk through the same empty lot. And, and, it's and go to the same terrible school that hasn't educated anybody yeah. in four generations. You know, and, and it's, it's a shame that nobody looks at that. And then you have people that represent them, that, that come to their door, knock on their door for a vote, and they come in blue jeans and a sweatshirt, and once they get in office, they're wearing a $400 tie. <laughs> come on, take a look around your own community. Mm. When you look at some of the... the, the um, Legislation that's being planned, now, not in Springfield, but not only in Springfield, but also here. You have, you have individuals that are elected to represent and keep safe their constituents. Some of the legislation, some of the attempts that they're making on, on minimizing policing, proactive policing specifically, um, is only going to further endanger their own constituents. And I've told them in Springfield, I said, you have to be careful on what you do. I talked about it with the investigatory stop order that they came out with. Where in Springfield, we were able to minimize all the language and make it just a small little contact card, similar to, to what we had. And then it comes back to Chicago and they give the authorship away. And it turns into this two-page document. And I'm thinking, and I told them, you are going to adversely impact policing. So you're going to see less and less contacts occur because it, it just becomes so cumbersome and it's so time consuming. We've got you and I have got a box that we're going to patrol for our nine hours, right? Eight and a half hours. In that box, that's our strategic assignment. And unless we get a call outside of our box, that's where we're at. So we've got in our box five hot corners. And they're, they're throwing dope. They're making money like crazy. It's all about money. <clears throat> On those corners, we've got the same players. They come out all the time, whether it's daytime, afternoons, or nighttime. They're still out there throwing. There's weapons there, there's shootings there because somebody wants their corner, so they're going to drive by and try and knock them off the corner so they can take it over. So it's a beehive of activity. If we stop this corner twice during our tour, there's five guys on there, that's 10 pages. We've also got four other corners. There's four, five, six guys on each one of those corners. Now we're at 20 pages and now we're at 30 pages, and now we're at 40 pages. And each one of these documents takes a couple minutes for us to type because we're not secretarial in our skills. And now we got to go back on the street, and we stop them again because somebody calls, now they got a gun. Or now somebody just drove by and shot at one of them. And now we go back and we stop them again. And hands-on contact dictates these reports. In the meantime, we've got calls for service we have to take care of. When we come out of the box at roll call, we've got... It's called a wrap. It's stacked jobs from the previous watch that they never caught up on. So we've got three or four of those waiting for us when we get our radio and get in the car. And it never stops. And then we got these on views or these other calls specifically designed for us to go and try to put a lid on or keep a lid on those, those hot corners. And that's each and every day. And then where these reports go is back to the ACLU. 
on, wait a minute, you got two white guys stopping all these African Americans 40 times a day? Oh my God. What's going to happen now if the affidavit is removed from complaints against policemen like they want to start in Springfield? Is those gang so they can do anonymous complaints. Right. And those gangbangers are going to have IPRA on speed dial. And Dan and Dean are going to get 20 complaints. The because, police review board. Right. We're going to wind up having complaints leveled, levied against us nonstop. And our sergeant's going to say, you know what, Dan and Dean, you guys need a hammer to hit you on the head? Stay away from that corner. These guys are beefing on you like crazy, and i got to do paper on each one of those beefs. I want to I want to pick up there, but I want to close the loop on Laquan McDonald. Uh, FOP took some heat, uh, some public outcry over hiring Jason Van Dyke, mm -hmm. the officer awaiting trial in the Laquan McDonald murder, uh, hiring him to do basically kind of menial tasks or work for ten bucks an hour, whatever it is, uh, while he's awaiting trial. Um, what's your response to those people who said, boy? Bad optics at minimum. I understand you have to represent your members, but hiring Jason Van Dyke to work for FOP while he's awaiting trial, not the greatest decision. That was my call, and I wear that, and I would do the same thing again tomorrow. And I apologize to people that take it the wrong way. But here's, a, here's an individual with two young girls and whose wife had a family business at a park district where she would teach a spin class or Zumba or whatever the heck they call it. You're, you're, you obviously are not taking spin classes or Zumbas because you know, don't know what they, you don't do know what I they are. Do I look like I'm taking yeah. spin class? <laughs> but but the, the Black Lives Matter and, and some other um, uh, voices from the neighborhood get on her website and start threatening her. Threatening her life, threatening her vehicle, threatening the lives and vehicles of any patrons that decide to go to that park and participate. So there are kids' moms and tots classes at that same location. She shuts her business down, and that's what they said. We're going to shut your business down. So they lose that. We generally find officers in a no-pay status at working opportunities, and it's an uh, unarmed security guard you know, right. driving around somebody's parking lot. So if I'm going to put Jason, who's been death threat, it death threats like crazy. I get death threats every week. And um, they don't want to work with him because he's got death threats against him. And you're unarmed, remember. So we can't find him a security job. I can't get him on a delivery truck because the guys that would hire him to deliver are worried about if he drops their goods at that store, they don't want to deal with that company anymore. So they'll lose business. I can't get him on a loading dock because he might not get along with everybody on the loading dock. So he's unemployable, completely unemployable. What are we supposed to do? And we've hired people before, the FOP has hired people before that have been in some pretty newsworthy incidents over the past. And all I did was repeat the practice. On the uh, issue of, of stops and what's going to happen, and you're you know, going back to the Dan and Dean hypothetical of mm -hmm. stay away from that street corner. So the numbers are out this, uh, so far this year. Um, we'll get to the violent crime statistics in a minute, but investigative stops down 90% year over year. Drug arrests tracking to be the lowest number since the Nixon administration. And I assume that's not because drug trafficking has disappeared in Chicago. So um, what is it that Chicago residents, and frankly, the metropolitan area, the world, Chicago's an international city, should understand about those statistics, the precipitous decline in investigative stops and in drug arrests? Is that, is that good news or bad news? It's bad news, and I told them this was going to happen a year ago. I said you are going to see these things drop dramatically. You cannot expect working policemen to take away from their work day and all those calls for service and everything else they do and then throw this on top of them and then send it to an organization that is not our fan. They you tell know. you. Yeah. And then now, to what end? Does that mean I get called up? Does that mean I go in behavioral alert? Does that mean I get removed from, from, my, from my position or from my district? And, and what happens with that when the sergeant tells us to stay away, we give him the corner. We lose the corner, we lose the block, we lose the block, we lose the community, and it's going to light up this summer. You've got to make sure that we don't 
minimize the capabilities of active police officers to go after people that are there breaking the law every day. We're not talking about the kid coming out of high school with his book bag and we tackle him and go through his books. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that population that, that people don't realize is extremely busy in our neighborhoods. And these are neighborhoods that we don't live in. A lot of our guys don't live in Inglewood or Roseland, but they go there every day and they work their rear ends off to try and keep a lid on it and try and keep those kids safe to going and coming from school. And most of the residents of that neighborhood, like every neighborhood, are law abiding. So they deserve yes, the same protection. They do. And they want the same protection. Right. I mean, this is kind of one of the other things that seems to be lost in the discussion is the residents of Inglewood and Roseland want the same things as the residents of Streeterville, where I live. Mm -hmm. they, they want to be safe. When the kids go to school, they want to be safe at night. So you're not doing them any favors no. by seeding turf to gangbangers. No, you're not. And, and, that's, and that's the downside of this anti-police campaign that politicians are running on. You know, they think that this is going to keep them in office. I think it's going to blow up. And I think the reverse is going to happen. Because someone's going to step up and says, you know what, we need the police. The, the law-abiding people weren't at the four forums that Lori Lightfoot held. God forbid they went to the mic and spoke about how much they liked the police and how much would they need more police there. They would have got chased out of those places. So they didn't show. She didn't hear from those people because those individuals are afraid to call 911 because people have scanner capabilities on their phones. And said, well, that's Mrs. Jackson or Mrs. Angelo calling the police. So we know where she lives. And the fear is at 3 in the morning, your front and back steps are going to be on fire. It's happened. So they stay back, and, and they don't participate. They don't go to CAPS meetings and complain because the gangs are sending people to the CAPS meetings to see complain. So what you have to do is realize that that population is huge in Chicago that like the police and want the police to take those kids off the corner. Now they can send their kid to the store. If they, can't, if they can't send their kid to the store, if the police don't participate in proactive law enforcement, what's going to happen is that store is going to be taken over and that store is going to go out of business or they're going to pay the store owner just enough money to keep the lights on so they can conduct business in the back room. So is this the Rahm effect? Is that a fair characterization? Uh, this like the Ferguson effect that you have? The decline, because uh, otherwise some, some people listening to this may say, well, wait a second, what, is the police don't want to do their job because they've got more paperwork to fill out? What, 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 what's that? Then find somebody who'll do their job and fill out the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So it's either, is the, are the police falling down the job? Is it the ROM effect because of policies and antagonism towards the department where you've put essentially the civilian leadership of the city on the other side of the skirmish line against the police? I mean, w what's the kind of major explanation for the numbers we're talking about. The biggest problem I see now is that you have people that have never had a weapon on their hip or been a police officer tell them police what to do. Um, Sheriff Clark from Milwaukee um, called me up. We talked a couple hours and, um, and he likens it to we have a, a death on the operating table and people get all upset and then we turn around and tell the surgeons how to perform their, 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 their operations. Or we tell the anesthesiologist what you should do setting-wise to keep the medicine just long enough where it doesn't kill somebody. So we participate and we give them direction. More people will die if we do that and they listen to us. If the surgeons listen to lay people, we're going to kill more people. Sheriff Clark has also said, because we had him on the show, and mm -hmm. he's no shrieking violet, as you no. know, Sheriff no. David Clark, Milwaukee County, one of my favorites. Uh, and maybe you should wear the cowboy hat like he does. No, I don't think I little, can pull it little, off. No. But, uh, but he also said, if the going back to the report, if the Chicago police uh, have a problem with systemic racism, as this report alleges, as Lori Lightfoot and her star chamber alleges, then Rahm Emanuel should resign because he's the civilian leadership. The city council should resign. They're the civilian leadership, and the civilian leadership sets the political culture. And they have oversight responsibilities over the police, over the fire, over first responders, over the entire city. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? I don't think that everybody in the city council or in city hall buys into that report, quite honestly. I don't they're think- They're not real forthcoming with saying so. No, because they're all, they all have to run for office. You know, and, it, and it's a way. That's a commentary on them, isn't well, it? Well, you know what? People want to be employed, but you've got to remember who you represent. You know, I represent the rank and file. That's who I work for. If they don't like what I'm doing, they'll vote me out. 
um, next year, around this time, as a matter of fact, in April. But, you know, that's my concern, and, and that's what my son's on this job. He's on the street. He's a Chicago police officer. Yes. And, and everything I do, I focus on him and making sure that what we do is right by the police officers. I can't be concerned about the alderman and this ward and what, his, what, what he wants to do to keep in office. That's on him. But what I told um, um, people in Springfield and what I've told people in, in city council is you have people that have never done police work, trying to tell the police how to do their job, more people will die. Well, and that's what's happening. Yeah. Because the first four months of this year, murders are up 50% year over year, shootings are up 70% year over year. Actually, through April, more murders than in 2012. Most murders in Rahm's tenure, for the, for the first four months of the year, more murders than in 2012, which was the, the great carnage year, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Not to be flippant about it, but that's what it was. And so is that a response to the Laquan McDonald controversy, the uh, other videotapes that ha have come out uh, with police misconduct, uh, Philip Coleman being another mm -hmm. one, for example, uh, combined with this police report, combined with the idea that uh, the civilian leadership doesn't have your back, rank and file police officer. And I think that's problematic. That's hugely problematic because you need people like superintendent you need people to come out and talk about why this guy's out of jail after he's got a long history of, of felony convictions that was involved in shooting three of our officers in a single incident you know in in, in it's the court structure it's the jail it's it's the overall state's attorney's office yes it, it, it's it's you have to coddle the offender I just heard that the, the number three down in, uh, or in Washington said we can no longer use the term convict or felon when we're talking about um, reintroducing people into the community that are convicts and felons. What, what's, what term do you use? Or are you supposed I don't know. to use? I don't know. I, didn't, I just heard it on the radio this morning. They're coming into New work. arrival? I don't know. Displaced Im person? Immigrant? Is, I don't know. From what, the prison system? I don't see why you have to walk lightly around offenders and violent individuals and then body slam police each and every day. If this was a football game, they'd be throwing flags for piling on. Every day it's a new headline. Every, every, everybody wants to get their ink, their columns on the backs of the police. Although they might, have, they might have written about public housing or they might have written about the schools or they might have written about real estate. Now everybody's a police expert. They're not police experts. The people in city council are not police experts. If they want, and if you look at Lori Lightfoot's report, there were five policemen involved in that report. They're all ex-bosses. And you need rank and file people to tell you how what you're going to do, what you're planning on doing is going to impact policing. And we don't have that anywhere in this, in this mix. You, you uh, essentially insinuated that it's going to be a violent summer. Uh, in Chicago, um, and, and of course it's already been a violent first four months as I just described. Uh, another friend of mine in the police force said, here's what's going to happen because of the culture right now and because of where things stand. Uh, something's going to happen in Streeterville or Lincoln Park or Old Town, one of the neighborhoods where violent crime isn't supposed to happen, like it's, you know, it's accepted that it's going to happen in Roseland or Inglewood or South Shore. It's going to happen. Somebody's going to get murdered. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be like, what the heck is going on? Somebody's going to get shot on Michigan Avenue. And people are going to be like, what the heck is going on? How could this be happening? Mm -hmm. And um, his suggestion to me was, this is what happens when you essentially <clears throat> tell the gangbangers there is no line between you and, and the rest of civilization. You can do whatever you want in your neighborhood or any neighborhood. Right. You think that's true? Well, I've been teaching at uh, higher ed for 22 years, and, and I've always taught that law enforcement is selective and deployment is selective. When you have body counts in Roseland on a regular basis, people get accustomed to it, and you don't increase the patrol or you don't increase the, uh, the notoriety or doesn't run a headline. But when you have an incident at the Paul, oh, my God, stop. What are we going to do? How are we going to fix it? It leads to exactly what you're talking about. There, there's more outrage and more ink devoted to uh, somebody's iPhone getting stolen on North Avenue Beach than there is 
seven people murdered, 49 shot over Mother's Day weekend right. in the neighborhoods that don't generate a lot of tax or revenue for the city. Or nine-year-old assassinated. Or nine-year-old assassinated. You know, and it has a very short lifespan. People should have been screaming about that poor kid. You know, it's a shame that we get accustomed and communities get accustomed. You got young kids that can tell you what caliber gun that last shot was, you know, and because it's the way they grow up. And, and they're so exposed to it, they get accustomed to that. When you go to a public school and, and you ask somebody who knows somebody that's been shot, every hand goes up. If that was the case at, at Walter Payton, or if that was the case at a North Side school, um, or in, in a more um, ritzy neighborhood, people would be outraged. But because it's controlled and it's environmental, people go, oh well, and they let it go. How could you let that go? you got to stop that. If you don't put a cap on it there, it's going to be in Michigan Avenue. we got people getting shot on every highway, on Lakeshore Drive at Foster the other night. And, and people are just going, oh, my God, well, it was 4 in the morning. It's, don't go out after midnight. Nothing good happens after midnight, right? But at some point in time, people are going to go, time out. What the heck is going on? That's why I'm telling them or I'm asking the electeds to hold off on your legislation. Let the DOJ finish the report. They're here. You know, everybody downtown um, and everybody in Springfield and everybody in city council trying to get ahead of the DOJ. Why? They're here. Yeah, but I mean, but... Wh wh Why are you trying to legislate something now when they're going to tell you what you need? And then it could be too late. We might not need all of this. But how, how sanguine are you about what DOJ is going to do? Are they... Do you, do you have any sense that, <clears throat> per their report in Ferguson, that they may do very much like what Rahm Emanuel's you know, assembled uh, task force said, which is, we have a conclusion, now we're going to work backward to provide a rationale, and we're going to mirror what Lori Lightfoot and the others said in that task force report. I mean, do you have any reason to believe the DOJ is going to be more even-handed than was the task force? Yes. Okay. I went out to Washington... Um, when um, Lisa Madigan wrote the letter requesting, and, and the mayor and the superintendent at the time said, we don't need them. Um, I was on the phone with our national president, Chuck Canterbury, that day. And I said, Chuck, can you get me on your agenda? And he goes, sure. I just read what's going on. He goes, let me make a phone call. He calls me back the next day. I'm on their agenda for Wednesday, the following Wednesday. This was like a Thursday. Um, I get there. And I'm supposed to meet with Loretta Lynch. I wind up meeting with uh, Vanita Gupta, the number two, and seven other, um, at least seven other attorneys from the DOJ, and Zach Pardon. Ms. Lynch is announced, is with the president about the San Bernardino incident, so that's why she wasn't with us. She announces on Monday they're coming. I'm already on their agenda from the previous week, because I know they're coming. You have to be an idiot to think they're not going to show. And I brought them our contract, and I brought them my, my background, my, my resume, and, then I, and, I, and I gave them videos that we put out for the FOP. And when I was talking to them... Videos like training videos? Well, or? we're your community, we come from your community, okay, got most of the guys profile up in the neighborhoods so where they work and things like that. Um, and, and we started talking, and when I had to tell them that we have police officers that have been on the job for 12 years before they took their first sergeant's exam, which is what happened, um, they go, how come? I go, no, when you get here, ask them. And they're writing like crazy. And when I told them that we have 70% of the in-car cameras don't function as, as intended, they go, why? I don't know. We've got GPS devices in the, in the roofs of the car. So it's not operator error. These are wired from the trunk through the roof, and they're not connected properly. The electricians are finding them left and right. 90% of the ones they found were never connected. And those cars have been out on the street for five years. So you're supposed to see a little dot where the car goes. You would think somebody at OEMC would say, hey, where are these cars? So, so you have a leadership problem in the department and in the civilian leadership as well. It's, then. it's the city that works. You know, yes. it's, it's, just, it's just another day in the Chicago Police Department. Our cars are terrible. We had to bargain for 400 cars that we bought every year in the contract. And they go, why? I don't know. I ask them why we had to do that. When, when people look at our contract, they see that we can change our statement once we make a, a, a view on a video that exists, once we find out a video exists. 
That's not what we wanted in that contract. We wanted the department to tell us if there was videos that were available so we could be more accurate on our statements prior to giving the statement. They said no. They want to play gotcha. Why? What kind of game is this? Well, but you can change the statement once you see the video. It makes no sense. When you read it, it makes no sense. It's like we pulled a, sh a shot on somebody. We tried to get the videos viewed early or before we made statements. We were told no. Then when I told them in D.C., they said, why? I said, I don't know. Ask them when you get here. I don't have answers for these questions. We're not trying to, to uh, keep bad guys on the street. We're not trying to pull a wool on people. We're not trying to get the city to, to pay out you know, these huge settlements. But how do you pay somebody $20 million that brings a gun to the street and points it at a policeman and gets shot? How do you pay that guy money? It's like payday. Come out, point a gun, and get paid. So when you, the issue of settlements and some $600 million in settlements the city has paid out for police-involved cases over the last decade, um, you're suggesting that, yeah, perhaps there were some incidents of cops doing bad things that exposed them to civil liability, and perhaps there are some cases where you should go ask the corp counsel at the city of Chicago why they're settling these cases. Exactly. Why don't they go to trial? I was sued years and years ago for $8 million. It ran for four years. Off, and on, off again, on again, off again, on again. It went from $8 million to $4 million to $2 million to $1 million, and they wound up giving the guy $30,000. And I said, don't give him anything. We didn't do anything wrong. Let's go to trial. It wasn't our call. But what was attached to the $30,000 settlement was two hundred eighty grand in lawyer fees. So the lawyers have a huge realization, the city's got deep pockets. You might not get your eight million, but I'll get my 300. You get my, your lawyers. Yeah. yeah. Shakespeare had something to say about lawyers. Um, <laughs> so I want to, uh, morale, morale, because this is something that's brought up all the time. You know, you're uh, uh, reducing police morale. And how important is that? How important is this? Because morale is sort of this nebulous concept. All of the things that we're talking about, how does police morale, as somebody who was on the street and now represents uh, 13,000 officers, majority of 13,000 officers uh, in the Chicago Police Department, you know, how, how does that manifest itself? Well, I, we had a, a general meeting uh, the third Tuesday of every month. And we had a meeting, it's probably about 250 people at the last one. and. I looked out at, from, from the mic, and we got some boisterous people, you know, girls and guys. Mm -hmm. and, and the union meeting is, 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 is quite active, <laughs> and um, even on a good day. You know, and they're sitting there like, they're just exhausted. They're, they're beat up. They're, they're sick and tired of the, of the brush they're being painted with. Um, they are going to court every day, they're still locking people up. They're still taking guns off the street. And, and when we hear things like there were 402 police shootings in an eight year period, um, the police are shooting 0.98 people, you know, almost one person a week for eight years. What nobody says is over those same eight years, we took 87,000 guns off the street, 87,000. We locked up 37,000 plus people with UUW arrests, which means you got a gun. Unlawful use of a right, weapon. Right, unlawful use of a weapon. When I look, and we also had 13,000 plus police officers battered in the same eight years. Nobody talks about that. But when I say that we had 36,000, 37,000 guns, 36,000 plus taken off the street with a body with a gun, and we only had 400 police shootings, each one of those had the potential to be a police-involved shooting. Nobody gives these girls and these guys credit for what they do. They're amazing. But everybody goes, oh my God, you're shooting one person a week. Or, and then it was, we're killing one guy a week. And then we're shooting him in the back. And, and, and all of this media stuff that it makes no sense, it's ridiculous, it's nothing but BS. But it gets that person writing about CHA, a byline on the front page. And that's all that matters. You know, it's hard to catch up to that lie with facts. But nobody cares about it because the lie's already out of the box. Right. Lie and they're travels. exhausted. They're, they're tired of it. You know, they're, they're getting aggravated, but they still go every day. There's no blue flu. 
there's no slowdown. Um, maybe the street stops are slowed down, but I can tell you that the calls for service have got to be through the roof. Yeah, a lot of travel <laughs> halfway around the world before truth gets its pants on, as Mark Twain, right? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, and, and also the contextual. I mean, if you're only, <clears throat> if you're kind of purposely uh, describing things out of context, that's tantamount to a lie. So this is where you manipulate statistics. Mm -hmm. right. So let me ask you another question about morale. You see uh, Rahm Emanuel, or Tiny Dancer, it's a term I've popularized for him. He doesn't appreciate it, but... Um, I wonder why. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to, you know, <clears throat> extol his career as a ballerina. Um, he uh, is willing to sell a billion dollars in city bonds so George Lucas can put his toys in a building uh, off Lakeshore Drive, but not willing to find the cash, nor is the city council, to hire more police officers. Uh, it, it, uh, do we need more police officers in the sh city of Chicago, and should that be a budget priority? I think so. I think we, we need, you mentioned 13, I think we're at 12 and a quarter. Okay. You know, but when I came out, it was 13.5. And um, <clears throat> I got a seven-year-old grandson, so I would like to see Lucas's Star Wars Museum here because he'd <laughs> love it. He's a Star Wars freak. But at the expense of hiring more people, we'd have to trade off. Um, I think that we need a lot more policemen. I also think we need a lot more detectives. And we have the largest ratio of supervisors to um, uh, subordinates. It's 14 to 1. 14 police officers to every sergeant. And, and that's unheard of across the country. That's one of the things the DOJ is going to come up with. If you look at their other reports, um, it's kind of cut and paste. Well, what, what, what about that? Just for a second, you talked about more detectives because one of the other issues is the clearance rate for murder yeah. investigations. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it has been 25% for a few years. This year, it's down to like 12 or 13%. I mean, if you're not holding people responsible, catching and, and prosecuting people that are responsible for murder, it kind of sends a message to the ecosystem that I can shoot and kill people and nobody's going to catch me. Right. When I was training new detectives, we had about a 46% clear-up rate. And, then, and I liked Terry Hillard, but he was, he was never a detective, but he was chief of detectives, and he was superintendent. And, and I see him, and if he sees us, he's going to say, why did you say that? Because it's true. When, <laughs> when, when he signed away the 72-hour rule, you could hold somebody for 72 hours. And, and he minimizes it, even though Cook County still has 72 hours. You've got a 48-hour rule, and so you, by the time you get arrested, the time you get cut loose, you're, you're done. you got to go or you got to get charged. And we said when that happened, we said, there goes the clear-up rate. Because all you got to do is hold your water for a couple of bologna sandwiches and, and a nap, and you're going home. So that was the biggest impact, I think, in the hmm. clear-up rate. Plus, we used to have over 1,000 detectives. We have less than 900 now, I believe. We just had a new uh, detective's exam, um, and hopefully they promote one more class before this exam is done because we're going to lose a lot of those guys when the insurance benefit changes in June. Um, if you're 55 years old and you have 20 years of service, your medical is picked up to your 65, and that ends in June. So a lot of guys are going to be going in this next calendar year. Um, that's going to have a big impact on the detective division where most of our senior people are at. And, um, and I think it's important for people to realize that the clear-up rate is associated with your workload. Um, when you have two days off, you're getting jobs put in your basket, even though you're not there as a detective that you have to get assigned, you get assigned and you have to clear them up. You have to contact victims and witnesses and, and progress the report. It's called moving the ax until you close it, either by arrest or lack of prosecution intentions or, or exceptionally cleared because you can't get in touch with anyone. So there are different options available to you for that. But in the meantime, you've got a late, a late list that you're already working on. And when you get an in custody, or an in progress, or somebody gets arrested, or you get a scene, everybody goes. And while you're working that scene, you're still getting cases dropped in your box. You never catch up, ever. By the time you're close to your retirement, you'll probably spend your last month or two, depending on the amount of volume in your clear up on your late list, to close those cases or suspend them to somebody else. Just so when you leave, no one else is hanging 
on your list, that they'd have no idea of what work was done, and now they have to go back and try to catch up on that. So the amount of work a detective has on them every single day, it never ends. It's like being on a, on a, on a spin wheel. And, and then you get from progresses and in custodies and scenes, and, and then you have court in the meantime. Those guys walk around with coffee mugs duct taped to their <laughs> hands. It's incredible. Uh, I, so you mentioned retirement. I have to ask you a financial question. Police pension, like the fire pension in the city of Chicago, less than 30% funded. Huge unfunded liability. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a political question in terms of political leadership, but it's also a financial question, particularly with the idea of wanting to hire more police officers. And uh, Illinois Policy Institute did a look at this. Uh, Chicago police officer retiring today, 30 years in, will have put in, these are round numbers, 135 grand in, mm -hmm. will have paid in 135 grand in, will get back something on the order of 1.8 million. Mm -hmm. uh, if they live to median life expectancy for their age cohort. I, is that a sustainable system in terms of that kind of return on contribution? And we talk about this with public sector unions across the board. Uh, and if it's not, it, or is the FOP interested in being a constructive voice in rethinking how we do public sector pensions on a go-forward basis for benefits not yet earned, go-forward mm -hmm. basis? so that uh, police officers who retire don't someday get an IOU in the mail instead of a pension check. Right. Well, we're working on that right now. We're not working on changing the system. I understand. But what we're, because if you change the system and... and Even you, prospectively, you, though. Right. And you put newer people in a 401k type of thing, which I believe uh, the governor loves and also to his people, um, they then deplete the contributions to the annuitants that are presently on, on retirement. And then the near future annuitants are depleted on their funding that's available for them to go. So you're going to have a population that just gets cut out. What even a, like a defined contribution system? Because the other, the other, the flip side of this is to say with that funding level, which is uh, like trending towards insolvency. I mean, let's be honest about those numbers. They're, uh, they, they should be very concerning to police officers that are in their 40s, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Um, what a, a defined contribution. So some kind of change on a prospective basis that ensures the financial solubility of the system. Well, what we're working on is, is to get Senate Bill 777 pushed, even though there's some controversy about that being the the uh, uh, a financial benefit for our members. Some, some people that don't know what they're talking about put out the governor should veto it, and that got me extremely aggravated earlier this afternoon. And, and tell people what 777 <clears throat> is. 777 is, the, is a re-ramping of the ARC that was um, the uh, required contribution that was done, uh, I think it was 2007, more or less. And, and right now the city owes us 598, 598 million. Um, under the new Senate bill structure of 777, which is linked to the casino, if in fact the casino ever comes, but it, it, it's a, uh, a new amount of about 472, I think, this year, which is already met by the property tax increase that we just had with the 500 million. Right. So that the city doesn't have to look for any more money. It gets us about 74.3 cents on the dollar for the next five years. And then it kicks back up and we wind up collecting the rest of the money that's owed us now under the old system. There is a mechanism in place in the new program in Senate Bill 777 that's not available in 3898, I think it is, um, where it's enforceable with a mandamus act. So we can literally go after them and get the money, the full amount. The old way is giving us the tax base, which is $33 million. When 11 goes to fire and 22 goes to us, that's nothing. So the people that think that we're better off with the old system than with the new one, um, just don't know what, they do not know what they're talking about. Do, do, you, do you think, I don't mean to interrupt, but do, mm -hmm. do you think Rahm Emanuel has been a good mayor for police, either from a public safety and job quality perspective or from a financial security perspective? I don't think his support is, um, is recognized as much as it, as it could be. And I don't know why, because 
he has a relative that's retired as a Chicago police officer, was a sergeant. He was actually a union representative as a detective. Um, he genuinely is concerned about the women and men of the police department. He is, is um, probably could be more vocal about it, but again, it doesn't get people to, in, you know, to his side of the, of the voting aisle right now. So, so as a 61-year-old, 36-year vet, I, I get it. Um, and I understand more now than I ever did as a younger policeman. I probably wouldn't be able to tolerate a lot. But uh, at this stage of my life, and focused on what we have ahead of us, I see that we have opportunities to, to, to work together to get through. Um, this, the language of 777 is one, because based on that language and the property tax, our pension will be okay. We don't have to get to 90%. Once you're at 60 70%, it starts feeding itself instead of feeding off of itself as it is now. They're selling assets. Yeah, cannibalizing. Right. So, so there isn't a long shelf life for us, and, and we need to do something now. So somebody that would think that it's good to veto that bill so we get written out of it if it goes back again is, is just it's idiotic. And, and is it the, the savior? No, but accompanied with the property tax dedicated to police and fire and the language of 777, um, it's important for us to try to secure as many opportunities as possible. Is it a fix? Completely no. But if you talk to a Ralph Mateer from the Tax and Budget Accountability, they know that there's a set level plane of contributions that has to be made. It's expensive in the beginning. But once it starts to level off, or levels off, and it's a steady stream of deposits that nobody else gets their hands on, <laughs> it goes right in the fund, like the IMRF, the, uh, the municipal, municipal retirement, retirement fund. Mm -hmm. They're 90-some percent funded. How is that? Because nobody gets it. it well, and right because municipalities fund. are required to make their yes, contributions right. under threat of... Right, but it goes, it goes to the controller, and then it goes to the fund. It right. doesn't go to anybody that's else. That's right. And that's what these are designed for. Um, and and what will happen eventually is that level plane is deposited, the property tax and, uh, and the new arc that we have, we will get to a point that those, those lines will, 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 will intersect sooner than they will now if they ever do any intersecting. So it, it's, it's an opportunity for us to fix this. Is it going to happen in my lifetime? Depends on how long I live. No. But it has to happen for my kid. It has to happen for those guys and girls that have 10 years on, 15 years on, and 20 years on. They need this. So we entered into an agreement with the mayor's office and, and with um, Springfield, and we were able to get this passed. So what we need to do is make sure that those things are, are we keep an eye on them and we, and we try to wiggle them through the process. And if the governor does veto it, then we have to make sure we work with the constituents down or the the electeds down Springfield to get that passed. So this is one less financial burden that anybody has to worry about. We're going to be okay if, in fact, we get that along with the property tax. We'll be okay. We won't be solvent next week, but we'll be on a, on a good path. Last item. I mean, if there was something that you could say to minority families in the city of Chicago in particular that live in some of those shooting galleries we've discussed mm -hmm. uh, uh, through the duration of our conversation right. on the west side and the south side about the Chicago Police Department, what would it be? Well, you know, we've got families that have grown up without a lot of trust in the police department and for obvious reasons, you know. It's, it's either the crime or it's mistreatment or it's just disrespect. Um, I think that what they need to know is that even if someone's a little off their game, um, the police are there to help you. The police are there to protect your families. We don't want to see these little kids get shot. We don't want to see you not be able to play outside or you not sit on your front porch. We want it to go back to the way it was. Will it ever go back? I don't know. Um, will we ever get everyone to like us? We're not out for that. There's a, there's, there, there's a, a job description that comes with policing that's going to aggravate people. It's going to piss them off because you're going to jail. And, and it might be your father. It might be your brother. And, and the prisons are loaded with people that didn't do anything. 
you know, and the police put me here for no reason, or they beat me into a confession. Lawyer screwed me. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. So, so what we what we have to do is make sure that we we meet that halfway. And and I've offered opportunities. I I talked to Kwame Roll. I talked to LG Sims. I I want to talk to to the the neighborhoods and 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 get out there. Um, but they don't want to deal with us. They don't like us because we've been painted with that brush that this was all on, on us, and that was wrong. So now they don't like us besides not liking the police. So it's difficult for us to, to now have to go over that speed bump that should never have been in place. But, you know, the, these ladies and these guys that are out there working in these districts in these high crime areas are there because they want to help. They want to keep a lid on things. Um, do we have some people that have to learn how to talk? Yeah, everybody does. Um, do we have some people that, that, that need to stop being aggressive with people that have done nothing? And, they, and Sure, but you've got to remember when we get out of the car, when we walk up to you, we don't know who you are. We don't know that you're legit. We don't know that you're coming from work. We don't know who the people are until we figure it out and talk to them. So if, you, if, we, if I come up to you and you want to box right away, well, you know, whoa, I don't know you. You know, somebody called me and you fit the description. So until I find out you're, you're okay, I'm going to be on guard. I'm going home. I got kids. I'm going home. Just follow so, Chris Rock, How Not to Get Your Ass Kicked by Police Rules, oh, I love and there's that. no problem. I love right? that. You know what? It's compliance. Do you, does, but an, an adult doesn't like to be told what to do. I get that. But as police, you can't paint that adult in a corner either because he's going to come out swinging. So there's got to be a happy medium. There's got to be a way for us to approach an individual and say, hey, listen, excuse me, but... But you're not going to say, hey, listen, excuse me, to a corner full of kids that are out there throwing rock and, and gunning up, because that doesn't work. That doesn't, not at all. You can't go at Mr. Roberts or Rogers, you know, excuse me, guys, let me button my sweater and let's sit down in <laughs> right. Kumbaya. Right. It's not going to happen. So we've got to know when to use that, that aggressiveness and when to not. And I think... You know, talking to people, getting people involved, I think hugely important now is for electeds to get in the squad cars. And I said with the, with the superintendent wearing the body camera, I said, put on a blue shirt. Don't go out there as a superintendent. Go out there as a beat guy, you know, and then see how that works for you. All right. He's Dean Angelo Sr. He's the president of the Fraternal Order of Police, Lodge 7 in Chicago. Dean, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. It was fun. It's great. Thank you.